and I've also turned on captions so you can toggle those off and on uh, depending on uh, whether you like to use those. Just a couple of notes. Um, please hold your questions until the end, unless you have questions of clarification that you can insert into the into the chat along the way, and I will pass them on to Dr. Nofert. Uh, we'll, uh, she's going to speak until about twelve forty or twelve forty-five, and then we'll wrap up. We'll take Q and A, and then wrap up our discussion around five minutes to one in order to transition to a professional development session with our PSC trainees. I will also just note that I will have a, our next presentation will be on February 21st, when we will hear from Professor Yun Zhu in the uh, Department of Sociology here at U of M, and that presentation will also be virtual. All of the brown bags this semester will be virtual, and we'll also keep you posted about other events coming up on the PSC calendar over email, so please keep an eye out for those. Okay, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Dr. Nopert if you're ready to go. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Paul. Oh, God. Wait. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Sorry. I think I might have done that. Apologies. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Just let me, let me. Okay. Everybody's good now? We're good. Okay. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much to, to Paul and Sarah for the invitation to present to you guys today. I'm excited to talk to Pop Studies because I have a special place in my heart for Pop Studies centers. I, I trained in them. I love the kind of intellectual conversation and the interdisciplinary nature of them. So I'm excited to be with you all. Uh, so for those of that haven't met me, I'm Grace. I joined the faculty here in 2020, and I'm sort of newish in that joining faculty when you're um, in the middle of a pandemic means I haven't met a lot of people in, in person. So um, I'm happy, like if you ever wanna pop by my office or, or have a Zoom, I, I love meeting new folks here. So anyways, I'm gonna talk today about, uh, the title of my talk is The Scars of Life Course Trauma on the Immune System of Older Adults. And I'm gonna be talking about how do we understand um, the ways that the immune system intersects with the social environment and, and what are the implications for population health? So as a way of a back or as a way of agenda here, I'm gonna first talk about um, this concept of embodiment and the rise in childhood trauma that we're currently seeing. I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview of the immune system and how it relates to the social environment, then talk about one particular study that we're, we're just getting ready to submit on childhood trauma and immune function in older adults. Um, and then before I go to the q and A, I'm going to make an unabashed attempt to recruit people to come work with our lab. Uh, we're always looking for new collaborators and new trainees, so I'll tell you a little bit about the projects that we have ongoing that might pique your interest. Okay, so my work kind of intersects three different domains. Um, infectious disease and social epidemiology, that's what I trained in as a doctoral student. And then all my postdoctoral training was in biomarkers of aging. So what happened is I started um, thinking about the ways that the social environment impacts infectious disease risk, and it got me thinking, um, having these infectious diseases for long periods of time must do something on your body. So that got me into really thinking about biomarkers of aging. I should also say my background is in biology, so I really love thinking about things at the cellular, even smaller level. Um, so that's where I did my postdoctoral work. And for me, um, this middle intersection here is where I really think there's a lot of hope to actually disrupt health inequities, to go beyond just documenting them and thinking about how do we disrupt them both at the structural um, level and then downstream from that. So that just gives you kind of a framing for how I see my own work. So today we're going to be talking about embodiment and the rise in childhood trauma and how does this concept of embodiment help us get our heads around what is going on with childhood trauma and what are the implications for population health? So this got started for me um, back in the fall, there started to be a lot of news articles around the number of children that have lost um, parents or caregivers to COVID-19. And it it's really focused on um, parents and secondary caregivers like grandparents, although I wanna say that there's, you know, there's a lot more people that, a, a lot more people in children's lives that have been lost to COVID-19. But there started to be a lot of papers that come, came out on just how extraordinary the numbers are with kids that have lost um, family members, particularly caregivers to the virus. And as a population health scientist, you know, this got me thinking, you know, we have had an extraordinary loss of life from COVID, um, but we should also be very concerned about what population health looks like in the future. 
um, because it's not just this collective trauma that we're all dealing with, which should not be downplayed right now, but it's also what, what are the implications for this for decades to come? And I should say, you know, these, these reports document that these losses are not distributed equitably, that children of color are more likely to have lost parents or caregivers as are children of lower socioeconomic status. So how then do we think as population health researchers what this could mean um, for the future of health disparities um, in the health of our population? So that brings me to this concept of embodiment. And uh, this work has been, you know, I think Nancy Krieger has been one of the people at the forefront of talking about embodiment, although it harkens back to a lot of um, biological work I've read on imprinting and priming and it has some similar um, feel to it. But Nancy writes this in her papers that bodies tell stories and those stories are about and cannot be studied divorced from the conditions of our existence, that they're often but not always they match people's stated accounts and that people cannot or will not tell either because they're unable, forbidden, or choose not to tell. So this concept of embodiment has been really foundational for me in my research um, because I'm, I'm always looking at this interplay between the social environment and biology. And there's a real through line in my work. And that is trying to understand the stories that the body is telling and the ways in which we see the patterns in a body that, that, that somehow they reflect a lifetime of experiences. And so our job as a researcher is to learn how to listen to those stories. And when I think about childhood trauma and what the unprecedented rise we're seeing in trauma right now, the, the thought that I have is, what are the ways that the body might tell that story for decades to come? And what are the signals that we need to be listening for? So that the question here becomes like, can biomarkers help us understand embodiment? Or maybe more specifically, can immune biomarkers help us understand the embodiment of childhood trauma? So this is all setting the stage for what I'm, the, the project I'm gonna talk you through today. Um, but before we go any further, I wanna hold up. And I, I told you that my background is in biology. So I wanna get us all on the same page about what is a biomarker. Cause I think it's, you know, as social scientists, we, we love to look at biomarkers. We love to put them in our research, but I think it's really good to take a step back and think about what actually is a biomarker. So a biomarker is a signal of an underlying biological process but it's often not the endpoint of interest and it only tells part of the story. So, I mean, I think about like a satellite, right? It's sending a signal down to our phones, but that signal is not the satellite itself. The biomarker is not the system of itself. It's a signal of a whole system of processes that are occurring and we're just getting one piece of that story. Um, and so when I think about biomarkers of the immune system, the immune system is terribly complex we're getting one piece of that story. And so how do we understand the system at work? Or maybe how do we acknowledge that there's a whole system at work? One of the, um, the papers that's been really foundational for me, and you know, I don't wanna, I, I struggle when I'm talking to sociologists and demographers, I don't wanna call it the theory behind my work because as an epidemiologist, we think about theory differently. Um, but this has been a really great theoretical inspiration, I'll call it. Um, this is a paper by Kathy Harris and Tom McDade on the biosocial approach to um, human development and behavior. And what it does is it breaks down in a really beautiful way that there are two major domains that are intersecting across the life course. On the top here is what we think of the social environment. And it starts at interpersonal relationships going all the way up to social stratification and political economy. On the bottom is the analog for the body, right? So it starts at this biochemical messenger at this, at this finest level. I would also say most biomarkers in this domain goes to organs and tissues and all the way up to the, the genome and the epigenome. And these two systems, they're interacting at multiple points across the life course. So that interaction, we're picking up at singular moments, but there's a whole complex system that's going on across the life course that I think we need to, to keep in the back of our head. So then what are immune biomarkers and what happens as the immune system ages? Because to understand the results that I'm going to show you, we really have to have some, you know, get on the same page about the immune system to start. And I love talking about the immune system. So um, this, this is fun. So a bit of immune basics. So the schematic that I'm showing here takes you um, through kind of the different levels from the least specific parts of the immune system, such as the skin, which is a large organ of the immune system, very nonspecific, all the way down to your adaptive immune system. 
So the immune system was designed to combat external threats and internal threats. So external like pathogens, internal threats like cancer. It's also triggered by other threats such as malnutrition and stress, which a number of you study these processes. There are two major components, the innate and adaptive, and there's varying degrees of specificity in the response here. So the innate immune system is gonna be your very nonspecific protective mechanisms. This is things like inflammation, which is very nonspecific, the whole body is inflamed most of the time, or fevers, right? Think about the last time you had a fever. That's not specific to one, one system, it's a system-wide nonspecific response to a pathogen. Then you have your adaptive components that are these very specialized cells. So all of these different components are moving across the life course and are responding to stimuli in different ways. So what sort of patterns do we see as the immune system specifically ages? And here I'm not just talking about chronological age, I'm talking about how does the immune system age? So we typically see an increase in inflammation. In fact, we call that inflammaging. Um, and we see this tipping of the scales more towards immune memory cells than naive cells, which means you have less new cells to deal with new infections. But the, my group um, also does a lot of work in, in the, the folks that I've worked with have been doing this for decades on persistent viral infections. And they put forward this idea that they're also a big piece of the immune aging story. So the persistent viral infections that we often focus on are, are herpes viruses of which there are eight main ones. And the, and the major ones that we look at are cytomegalovirus, CMB, herpes simplex virus one and two, varicella zoster, and Epstein-Barr. So for a long time, folks thought that these herpes viruses were kind of a nuisance virus. They weren't something you typically went to the doctor for. They didn't cause, they, nobody thought they caused a lot of, of poor health outcomes. So they were just a little bit of a nuisance virus. But in recent years, um, there's been a lot of work that shows that these persistent viral infections are just quietly wreaking havoc on a number of your body systems. So what happens here is typically sometime early in the life course, you get infected with one of these guys um, and your body goes through this process of latency and reactivation. And what I mean is you get primarily infected and your body dumps all of these immune resources to tamp that virus down into a latent or quiescent state. So it's not replicating anymore. And then something happens and it triggers that virus to reactivate. Um, just think about stress or another chronic health condition, something tells your body, uh-oh, something's up and that virus reactivates. And then your body has to, again, dump a bunch of immune resources in to tamp that virus down. And that process is very costly. And the hypothesis that we really pursue is the idea that the number of times this process of latency and reactivation happens is related to your social position and the stress that you experience. So that's why we, we really think persistent viral infections are a major um, player in the immune aging story. And this is, it's this link between um, the immune system and, and viral infection. So I think there's a, there's a lot here. I won't get into it all, but if you're interested, I love talking about this stuff. So please, please hit me up. And I also just want to say there was a major paper that came out in science a couple of weeks ago that that's really, it's a very elegant study. If you haven't had a chance to read it, it's incredible, but it links Epstein-Barr virus titers with, with the development of multiple sclerosis. So really showing this idea that these are not nuisance viruses. These are really big things that we should be paying attention to. So this idea then is that persistent viruses are one of the ways that we see acceleration of immune aging. In using cytomegalovirus CMV as an example, um, the immune control of CMV can tell us something as a proxy measure for overall immune fitness. This process of latency and reactivation over the life course is affected by stress, is what the, this is what we're really trying to pursue in our work. And so then when you look at CMV immunoglobin levels, they tell, they're an indirect measure of immune aging. So they're this proxy measure that tells you like if somebody has very high IgG levels to CMV, very high antibody levels, then their, their immune system is not dealing with that virus as well as it could. And so that tells you something about the age and we would call that a more aged immune system. So going back, what sorts of patterns? We see an increase in inflammation as the immune system ages. We see more memory immune cells than naive cells. Um, and we see less control persistent infections like CMV. So you would see more antibodies. 
But then as we turn to as social scientists, the question that we should ask is, do we see these same sorts of patterns in people that experience sustained disadvantage, such that it mirrors accelerated immune aging, despite whatever chronological age a person is, does sustained disadvantage induce an accelerated age pattern in the immune system? So it's not just about chronological age that it's advancing immune aging, it's about all of these environmental cues that the body is keeping in. So coming back to this question now, can immune biomarkers help us understand the embodiment of childhood trauma? And enter the health and retirement study, which is a study that I particularly love. I think they are at the forefront of a lot of, of new ways of thinking about both the social environment and biomarkers. Um, so I think they're the perfect study that I could ask this question in. Um, they have this, this beautiful module that they asked people called the Life Histories Questionnaire, where they asked folks to remember all of these amazing details about their life. Not just, you know, how much trauma did you experience and what kinds of trauma, but how many books did you have in the house and where did you live? And it's a, for social scientists, I think there's a wealth of, of really great information here. They also have the Venus Blood Study which as a person interested in infections in the immune system, this was just, this is like a gold mine to me. And they're one of the first population-based studies to really do a, a deep dive into a number of different immune markers. So this was the perfect opportunity to think about this question. So the study question um, that we pursued, there were two. One, is there an association between experiencing parental loss or parental separation before the age of 16 and immune function in later life? And two, are there racial ethnic disparities in these associations? So we're really trying to understand this early life experience of trauma, honing in on the loss of a parent or separation from a parent, and then immune function in later life. Before I go any further, I wanna acknowledge that I would be nowhere without my team. And this, this work has been done in collaboration with a number of incredible collaborators that um, we've really had to put our heads together on how we think about this. So I wanna thank them right up front um, this, they're so foundational to the way I do my work. So I'm very grateful. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time going over the HRS. I know a number of you here are very familiar with the HRS and it's incredible. It's an ongoing nationally representative survey of older Americans. Follow up occurs every two years, but importantly for this, we're going to use immune function data that was taken in 2016 as part of the Venus blood study. And our early life trauma data is coming from the 2015 and 2017 life histories questionnaire. And then we're taking demographic data from the 2014 and 2015 core surveys. Okay. So uh, we had a little over 6,000 people in our sample, and those were people that had immune measures in the life history data. The mean age here was 69 years. And we looked at four measures of immune function. And we chose the four because we wanted to get ones that were distinct, but all a little bit related. Um, and they're all, we, we use continuous levels and they're all log transform because they're very skewed. Um, so we looked at CMV, immunoglobin G antibody levels, C-reactive protein, um, tumor necrosis factor, and IL-6. So the latter three are typically understood as inflammatory markers. Although, I'm gonna take this moment to plug, there's a really great paper that came out um, for social scientists it's on rethinking CRP and IL-6. And the assumption that they're, they're always inflammatory markers is not true. Sometimes they're operating the anti-inflammatory. All this to say, there's a big system at work underneath all of this of the, and the immune system is very complex. So we can't always assume we know the direction that these markers will go in. We had two binary indicators for our exposure here. Um, one of parental loss. So before the age of 16, did you ever live in a children's home or orphanage or foster home or did one of both of your parents die? And then a binary indicator of parental separation um, before the age of 16, were you ever separated from your mother or father for six months or longer? Uh, we looked at a four category um, race ethnicity variable um, and included sex and age and parental education, which we also classified as a four level variable. And um, just to give a little bit of a, the thinking behind what covariates we chose to include in our models. So this was the main association we were interested in, um, parental loss, parental separation and later life immune function. 
Uh, we know that there are age and sex differences in immune function, so we controlled for those. And then we really did a deep dive into trying to understand the role that race played. So we conceptualized race ethnicity as a proxy of one's lived experience and as such a really strong determinant of the burden of traumatic events that are experienced across a life course. And these categorizations are the result of the social process of racialization that has systematically placed certain individuals in separate and unequal contexts, resulting in these different differential and disproportionate exposures to certain social, environmental, and economic factors. So I'll get into a moment how we thought about race, but we followed some guidance by a paper that I really recommend by um, Whitney Robinson's group on how to really understand racial disparities in health and how to model it. We conceived of parental education as a potential confounder of this relationship and so controlled for that. Um, but then there was the question of, well, we have this exposure that, you know, is, is before people were age 16 and then there are immune markers that are, you know, measured sometime in their 60s or later. And my collaborator, Jen Dowd, said, well, what do we, what do, we do about the entire life that's happening in between that? Um, and this paper was not meant to be a, a formal mediation analysis, but we felt like we had to do something to nod to what could be happening. Um, so thankfully, HRS has a wonderful job of collecting a number of different variables. So we have an additional model here that controls for adult SES, adult health conditions and health behaviors to at least get at what could be mediating this association. Okay. So we did multiple imputation for missing data, and we constructed a series of linear regression models, um, separate sets of models for both parental loss and parental separation. Our outcome here were each of the four log transformed immune outcomes. We stratified by race ethnicity. I'll, I'll tell it, say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and I'm not gonna show the entirety of our model building strategy or our results because there are a lot. Uh, but model one is going to control for age and sex, model two adds in parental education, and then model three is this kind of potential um, mediation model, which is includes adult health status, SES, and adult health behaviors. Okay, so getting into the how do we think about racial ethnic disparities in this, these associations. So this paper by Ward et al. And, and Whitney Robinson was a senior author on it, does a really great job of laying out um, guidance for how to do this. And Whitney is an incredible social epidemiologist who thinks about the ways that we model race ethnicity and how do we do that? How do we do better as social epidemiologists? So if you haven't seen this paper, check it out. But the steps here are to first examine the distribution of the exposure by race ethnicity, to examine the distribution of the outcome by race ethnicity, and then to look at interaction terms and or stratified analyses. So I'll, I'll let you read the paper to get the full scope of how we carried this out. Um, but this is the guidance that we were doing. And I, I should say this isn't just for racial and ethnic disparities. You could do it for education. You could do it for gender. So this is it's a really fantastic paper that I, I love papers that give like a solid toolbox and this one does. Great. So getting into our results. So I'm going to show you the first the distribution of the exposure and outcome by race ethnicity. Like I said, there's too many results to show all of them. Um, so here we go. So on the top here are each of our immune measures. On the bottom are the, is the distribution of our exposure variables by race, by race ethnicity. And I'm gonna focus on just two of the immune measures in, in this talk um, because there's a lot of results here. So first of all, these are um, the mean levels of log transform CMV antibody levels. And what we see here are that racialized minority populations have much higher um, antibody levels of CMV, which we think is suggested of less immune control or a more aged immune profile than non-Hispanic whites. You see a, a same kind of pattern for IL-6, which we typically think of as a pro-inflammatory cytokine. So you see much higher levels um, among non-Hispanic blacks and Hispanics compared to non-Hispanic whites. What is really striking to me is the distribution of the exposures. So um, this is the proportion of the population of our study population that experienced parental caregiver loss before the age of 16. For non-Hispanic Blacks, that was 35% compared to 17% of whites. Um, for separation, it's a similar story. 44% of Blacks, 31% of Hispanics experienced parental separation before um, the age of 16 compared to 20% of whites. So already you see an enormous disparity um, in the distribution of, of both of both the immune and the immune aging markers and um, early life trauma. 
So next I'm gonna get into showing some of the stratified regression analyses. We did run regression analyses on the full unstra unstratified sample. We looked at interaction terms and we, there's a lot more to this, um, but you'll have to read the paper. I'll just pique your interest there. So this is the model um, for experiencing parental loss. And this is with CMV as the outcome variable and it's stratified by race ethnicity. So I have a, I have a cheat sheet for you for the, on the model building strategy at the bottom of the slide. And so these um, effect estimates have been exponentiated. So let me take you through this. So looking at non-Hispanic Blacks in model one, among non-Hispanic Blacks, those that experienced parental loss before the age of 16 had a 34% increase in their CMV antibody levels compared to those that did not experience parental loss. We see a bit of an attenuation um, with the inclusion of parental education in model two in the other adult health status and health, adult SES in model three, although not much, it's, I mean, you still see a sustained association there. For whites um, in model one, we see a 12% increase in their antibody levels comparing those that experienced parental loss versus those that did not. But that, um, that association gets very much attenuated when you control for parental education and then the adult health status and SES variables. Just give you a second to look at that. When we look at separation, um, the pattern looks similar, although it's a, it's a bit different. Um, for Blacks, we see that they start out with um, those that experienced parental loss had a 10% increase in their CMV antibody levels. Um, but that actually gets greater when we control for parental SES and for adult SES and health behaviors in models two and three. Uh, we see a similar sort of patterns happening for Hispanics and those classified as other race, although both of those um, groups are, are really small cell sizes, so you see very wide confidence intervals on those. We thought it was really important um, to include both Hispanic and other race in this investigation. We didn't want to ignore them, so that's why they're in there, but they're it's pretty small population. Um, and for whites, you, you see that um, those that experienced parental separation had a 27% increase in their antibody levels. Um, and that association stays more or less the same in models two and three. So that's CMV. So the other one I'm gonna focus on is um, IL-6. So IL-6 is a really interesting inflammatory cytokine that gets a lot of press. Um, but the, res the, the results here are, are a little bit hard to, to wrap your head around. And I will say, this is a first pass at work like this. I think this, these findings of anything tell me that there's a lot more work to be done in this domain. So for non-Hispanic Blacks, um, looking at model one, you really don't see much of an association between parental death and um, IL-6 levels. But then once you control for parental education in model two and then adult health status and SES in model three, you actually see a reduction in IL-6 levels among those that experienced parental death compared to those that did not. In whites, that those associations are reversed, um, which I think is just, there's a lot here to, to really think about and try to unpack. In whites, you see a more predictable, what you would expect pattern with experiencing parental death, but I think there's a, and I'll, I'll talk about this in the conclusions, there's a lot more to this story um, than you just see looking at these associations. Uh, when you look at experiencing parental separation in IL-6, uh, it's the same story as, as experiencing parental death, but more exaggerated in my mind. So among non-Hispanic Blacks and Hispanics and other race, um, you see a reduction in IL-6 levels comparing those that experience parental separation to those that did not, whereas whites, you see more or less um, the same association, though not as strong among those, comparing those that experienced parental separation to those that did not. So I'm gonna let you sit with that for just a second before I move on. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about some limitations and conclusions to this work um, that I think, I think should be stated and maybe help us understand what's going on. Uh, so first of all, there's just, these are self-reported, these exposures, so there could be some bias in how people are reporting these um, traumatic events, although there's a lot of research um, with the adverse childhood experiences literature that talks about people can pretty accurately report exposures of trauma early in the life course, so I'm not super worried about this. Um, we group together multiple types of parental loss and separation, so in the loss exposure variable, you'll notice that we 
in that variable, there was people that were in orphanage or foster home and people that lost, like one of their biological parents died. Those are likely very distinct processes. So I think future work could really look at those on their own. We also separated out parental separation. Um, and that was, there were two variables combined in that. Did you, were you separated from your mother and were you separated from your father for six months or longer? Those are also actually probably very distinct. We separated those out from parental loss because of some work that my colleagues did who study non-human primates that really talk about that those are very separate um, exposures. But, you know, there's there's a lot here that these processes may be ca capturing distinct um, traumas. And so maybe maybe it would be worth worthwhile looking at those individually. But one of the big issues that I think here is selection bias. And there, I think there's a good probability that those ex those that experience the most trauma may be less likely to have survived to later life. So the folks that we see that made it into the HRS and made it to late life may be fundamentally different than those that experienced a lot of this kind of trauma early in the life course. And so I really think we need to think about selection bias when we kind of contextualize these findings. Um, also, the immune measures were only measured once and they were measured later in the life course. So we're in missing this entirety of the story that's happening in midlife and late life and how these immune measures are changing and they're dynamic. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a major caveat here and kind of hearkening back to where I started, these were only a few measures of immune function and it misses the entire story of, of the immune system. And, you know, that's, that's going to be a limitation to a lot of this kind of work. And I still think it's worthwhile, but I think it's also worth mentioning that this, these are single signals of an entire dynamic um, biological system at work. Okay, so what are the conclusions from this? So first of all, without even looking at the regression analyses, we can see that early life trauma and immune function are not distributed equitably. And that in and of itself, I think is a really striking finding. The, our evidence is suggestive that early life trauma somehow becomes embedded in the architecture of the immune system. I'm certainly not making a causal claim about this, but I do, I, I think this is good preliminary evidence that there is some kind of sustained impact of early life trauma on the immune system. And we should be paying attention to what the immune system is doing um, as a way to understand this. This is particularly true with looking at the immune system's ability to control cytomegalovirus and another um, kind of reason that we should be we should be investigating these herpes viruses for for how they're aging the body there could be some partial mediation by later life SES and health but not fully and i will say this is we need a lot more research here so if anyone's interested in doing that i love would love to have help with this but there's also this idea has been really keeping me up at night like do we see resilience at play here is or part of the part of what we see among um non-Hispanic Blacks and Hispanics, especially with IL-6s, maybe that is resilience. And how do we think about that? How do we model that? Um, I think that's, that's a really worthwhile question. But to bring it back um, to where we started, we are seeing an unprecedented rise in childhood trauma. And this is just part of that story. We need to anticipate as population health sciences, health scientists, what that will mean for health and develop meaningful interventions. You know, I work in a field with immune health and, and infectious disease that you can conceive of interventions to address some of these things. Um, and I, I think that it's our job to really think about that. You know, we are, we're living in this tension that we both have to deal with this very real pandemic that we're all living through and think about what lies ahead. And I think this work uh, really highlights the ways that we should be doing that. So just not to, um, not to forget where we started, that there's a whole other pandemic happening um, with orphan children and, and that's gonna have repercussions for decades to come. So actually, before we do thoughts and questions, I wanna do a little bit of a, a, a pitch to come work with our lab. So we've got a lot of interesting projects that are happening that I would love to have collaborators and trainees working with me on. Um, we've got a, a, an R01 that knock on wood, we're supposed to get a notice of award on any day looking at immunosenescence and Alzheimer's disease and related dementia and understanding and equities in these relationships. I am actively looking for a postdoc for this position. So if you're interested, please message me or if you have someone in mind. We've got a whole line of work looking at neighborhoods and immune function, which is very exciting. And I, I will tell you, spoiler alert, the relationships we're seeing here are just incredible and kind of blowing my mind. I'm also very interested in causal inference for policy relevant interventions in, in the social epidemiology realm. So if anyone's 
any students are interested in kind of pursuing this, I would love to work together on this. We've got um, a, an exciting line of work called the COVID Neighborhood Project that's really aimed at understanding the ways that COVID has shaped um, or that neighborhoods have shaped COVID and what are the results for neighborhoods for a long time to come. And about a year and a half ago, some colleagues of, of mine here and at Johns Hopkins launched the Social and Environmental Equity and Infectious Disease Lab, or SEED, that's really aimed at both understanding how this intersection happens between social environmental factors and infectious disease, but also how do we disrupt those pathways. So if any of this interests you, please send me a message. I'd love to, to meet over Zoom and get in touch. Um, and with that, I will, I will let Paula tell me what, what's next for questions. Okay, that was great. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, yeah, so I get, we can open the uh, floor to questions. So um, please feel free to raise your Zoom hand or uh, signal in chat that you have a question. Or if it's quiet, you can just go ahead and speak up. Okay, well, I'll ask a question while we're waiting for people to work up their nerve, Grace. Um, so yeah, your presentation was beautiful. And I thought the graphics just really uh, just supported a really elegant story that you're telling. Um, I guess I I want to step back a little bit and just make sure that I'm understanding the kind of conceptual story that you're putting together because a lot of your um the, the upfront part of your presentation was about the role that infectious disease plays in aging the immune system. But then um, the example, the empirical example you gave was one about experiencing childhood trauma and how the long-term impact of that on the immune system. So I mean, it's just in thinking through the mechanisms there is the thought that um, children who experience trauma may already have aggravated immune systems, or is it that the tra that trauma is weakening the immune system that makes people more vulnerable to viral infection? I guess I'm just trying to think about how this life experience impacts or interfaces with risk of exposure to virus and yeah. what the consequences are. It's a good question. It's one that we have been trying to tease apart in our work for quite a while. So I think it's probably a multifaceted uh, pathway here. I think children that are disadvantaged, and we have work that empirically shows us, are more likely to be um, infected with some of these viruses at an earlier age, which means they're living with them longer and it's longer time aging your immune system. I think the other part of that is, even if the, you know, if the probability of infection was all equal, children that experience trauma are more likely to be, have the stress and burden that reactivates those infections, which means they're aging your immune system in a more accelerated way. The thing is, is we need the kind of life course studies that test this at multiple times to really empirically show this. But I, I think it's probably both. And I think there's a, probably a neighborhood and SES component to this, right? That, you know, children that experience trauma are like probably more likely to live in certain environments and be more likely to expose to a number of infectious diseases, including the, the viral infections I talked about and less and have less immune control of those. So I think that it's a great question. It's one we're really trying to unpack in our group, but we need, we need big life course studies to really look at that too. Okay, great, thanks. So I see a couple of hands raised. So I will just turn to those because I see them, but we also have some things coming in through chat. So I'll be bombarding you with questions, but I'll turn to Wade Chin first. Oh, hi, Dr. Noper. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. Uh, I have two questions. So first is about biomarker. I started recently learning the biomarker, things, uh, especially CRP. Uh, my question is, do you think the biomarkers can be something genetically or partially genetically inherited from their parents? And how can we control that? And my second question is, I'm very interested in life course perspective. So I study aging and the health myself. I'm wondering like, um, so we study in the study, um, it's, uh, we tested the relationship between the childhood the trauma to later life inflammation. But I mean, across the life course, there can be so many other traumatic e events that happen. Uh, I mean, their middle, middle adulthood or emerging adulthood, like how can these factors be controlled or considered in like making the conclusions? Yeah, thank you. Those are really great questions. Um, so first of all, 
I, so the the genetics part, I don't know if Coulter's on here. I think I see Jessica on here. There are a lot of folks that are doing um, work in that domain that I think would be better suited to answer that. I think biomarkers is a huge realm, right? So I look at immune biomarkers, but there, you know, you could think about epigenetics as a biomarker, which I would be curious if the epigenetics folks think of that, like maybe, you know, different epigenetic marks as immune bio or biomarkers. So that's a good question. Um, I think there is some evidence that, you know, the ways that are, we deal with certain viruses, there is an epigenetic component to that. Uh, so that's certainly something to think about. The inheritance piece, I, I'm not sure, you know, I think a lot of what what I'm looking at in my work is stuff that's happening in real time um, that is coming from your environment. So these are these are great questions, but I, the inheritance piece is something I haven't thought a ton about. I do think your propensity to deal with certain infections certainly could be something that is part of um, at least your epigenetic architecture. I have to I'd have to ask the colleagues over in PNG what they think about that. Um, but your other question about there's a whole lifetime of stuff happening. You're exactly right. There is an entire life course, and you know, training with sociologists um, has taught me that we have to think about the ways that kind of SES perpetuates itself and trauma perpetuates itself, and is is working in this cycle across the life course. So kind of like I alluded to here, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done that really applies kind of robust tools in mediation and in life course. Um, studies to really unpack what are the pathways. You know, one of the questions I have is, you know, are there distinct pathways through which trauma actually works to affect health across the life course? Or is there something about trauma that kind of inalterably affects your immune architecture early in life? And then you can't, you know, there's not a lot that you can do to get out of that. I personally think that there has to be something that's happening that can kind of mitigate or, or, or exaggerate those effects. But I think the next line of work should be about really understanding what's happening in that whole entire, you know, 60 some years in the middle of life that I think is probably really important. Yeah, thank you. And we have a question in the chat that I think follows on from the first part of Wadey's question from Jan Stromberg asking, have you been able to check IL levels in any of the parents of your subjects or perhaps siblings or family members? Do you have any sibling pairs with different results, et, et cetera, despite similar traumas? That's a great question. Um, so this is the HRS. I don't think we could check parents. Um, and I will have to ask, I haven't thought about sibling pairs. As far as I know, I can't check that in HRS, but Part of that, what we'd like to do eventually is, is replicate this kind of work using the studies like Ad Health, the National Study of Adolescent to Adult Health, which I think we could interrogate some of those, those questions in Ad Health, but I, I'm, I don't think we have the capacity in HRS to do that. And then we have another hand raised from Jennifer Wu. Hi. Hi, Dr. Nopper. This is really interesting research. I had a question about how you're um, sort of conceptualizing early life trauma using loss of a parent as, and if there were like other um, either traumatic events that occurred or other aspects of early life trauma that you can sort of incorporate because I don't know how much loss of a parent reflects uh, a stressful experience versus like change in SEP status as a child. Yeah, so you're you're um, hitting on something that we really went back and forth on. So we started this work by looking at using like an index of 15 or 16 indicators of early life trauma. So they collected a bunch of them, and then we had indicators of midlife trauma and late life trauma. So um, there, so there was a lot of room for that kind of investigation. We decided to really hone in on specific traumas to to try to get you know be specific in our associations and really try to understand what was going on. Um, but there's a lot of other questions. So one approach that you could look at is actually doing an index of trauma. The benefit of that is that you're getting a more, a bigger picture of, you know, whether one, whether person's just experienced one trauma or, you know, four or five, and what does that mean? The downside of that is that you, you don't have as much specificity in thinking about what's the mechanisms through which that specific trauma is, is working to impact health. But I think that there's a lot of room for that kind of work. And what I'd like to see happen as a follow-up is looking at kind of a life course. Um, so from early life trauma to what does that mean for midlife to later life and really, really parsing that over, out over the life course. 
In addition to looking at individual traumas or a total sum, did you consider looking at sort of the interplay or patterns of co-occurring early life traumas? Because I feel like yeah. sums can be a little bit misleading because as you know, like different types of trauma can be more impactful than others. hundred percent. I think it's a great idea. Um, and I, this, it's a project I would love to work on is actually looking at, you know, where, how do those intersect, which sp specific types of trauma seem to hang together and what does that mean? Yeah. I think there's, there's a, you're, you're picking up on, there's a lot of room for follow-up. This was a first pass for us, but there's a lot of room for follow-up studies. Okay, I think we can turn next to Jessica Fall, who had a question in chat, but I've asked her to unmute and ask it so I don't mispronounce anything. Sure, Paul. Can you hear me? Hi, Jessica. Um, hey, how are you? Hi. Thanks for presenting today. My question uh, was actually about CMV uh, antibody titers. So when we have a high titer level, does that mean um, you know, that the body is sort of actively fighting an infection or, or, um, reactivation, or is it some more longer term indicator of many or love, like how many times it's been fighting, um, you know, the, the reactivation of the virus, I guess what I'm wondering is how variable is this measure over time? Because I think about how often do I need to measure this in order to get, an idea of someone's sort of longitudinal experience with the virus? Uh, well, I will tell you that, you know, or does no not, one know? not that I'm trying to influence the HRS, but I think you uh -huh. should measure it multiple times so that we can start understanding that process. Yeah, but are we talking like, is it, I guess I'm wondering, is it like a monthly, you know, I mean, we would never be able to do that, but you know, I guess I'm just wondering how variable is this in someone's body? So like, if I were to measure it now and next year, is that going to look pretty much the same? Or is it really going to be something that's much more short term, in which case, if I can only do it every year or two, it's it's still going to be kind of a proxy of what's going on. So my understanding with IgG is that it's much longer term. So if you had IgM and IgG, you might be able to parse out this latent versus kind of active infection piece. Mm -hmm. um, our, but, you know, the timing of it. That's a great question, and I think it's something that we, my collaborators and I, have been talking about quite a bit because there you don't have a lot of life course studies that have measured multiple times. So I, you know, I, I don't know how stable it is from decade to decade. The way that we think about it is that if you see these higher antibody levels, that it's indicative of like a a longer longer term, your immune system's kind of doesn't have the resources to keep fighting it, and so you see higher. Because usually what that goes along with is that you have more immune cells that are devoted to CMB at that, at that point. So more of your memory cells are soaked up by CMB or other persistent viral infections, mostly CMB. Um, so as far as the antibody levels, you know, I don't, I don't think it's the case that you would measure somebody, they had high antibody titers at 65 and at 75, those would be lower. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think you would necessarily okay. see that, but okay. I don't know. I would love to know, like from the age of 20 to 65, how do they change over time? Well, and I can't do that for you, but, <laughs> but you could get at, you know, among older adults. Yeah. yeah. And then I answered in the chat, but to respond to Jan's question about, um, siblings and parents and all that. So, in, you know, by design, we can't really do that in the HRS. A couple of them will exist, but we do have spouse partner peers. So it might be interesting, I have no idea sort of what the household level correlation is in CMV um, infection or titer level, but it might be a way to piece apart sort of this early life versus the rest of your life. And we know the length of time people have been married and we know what time things happened. And, you know, you would know whether they both experienced those things. I mean, it, it's not perfect, but it might be an interesting way to, to look at those dyads as sort of yeah. a unit of exposure. I just wrote that down. I think that's a great follow-up study to do because I mm -hmm. think it would be really interesting. Yeah, fun. Thank you for your question. Thank you. All right, thanks. So next we have George Alter. Hi, I, I think this this is great work. I'm 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 very impressed in, and I think it's it's wonderful. I, I have a question about um, really about how you if you have some thoughts about how to get at the selection mm -hmm. argument, which is which is quite difficult. Um, and um, 
so and I two sort of not really full thoughts, but related things. One is that if I understand correctly, when you're made, when you're looking at the the effects among blacks and among whites, they're at different levels. Is is that and could that be part of the the explanation that that maybe um, blacks just have their higher levels to be to begin with, you know, at the at the mean are 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 somehow changing the relationship to the other variables. Um, and the other was, is there a literature that relates um, these kinds of these biomarkers to uh, to mortality directly? I'm thinking, you know, one way to to try to think about selection would be if you had enough data, you could try to simulate yeah. what's happening between age 20 and and you know and, and age 65. Um, anyway, it's fascinating work, and I. I I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, delighted to see all the all the progress you're making. Yeah, thank you very much. These are great questions. Um, to, before I forget, yes, there is a literature that relates these persistent viral infections to premature mortality. So we know that that uh, that work has. There's a lot of work that's been done on that domain. So I feel confident saying that. Um, for the selection issue, I would actually turn to you guys, my colleagues in in pop studies, to think about how do we model that, how do we think about that, and adjust for it. Um, because I think it's a huge issue. I, I think I think in our in our data, how I'm thinking about it is that racialized minority populations are are starting at a higher level of some of these immune biomarkers and also have a different slope. So that you, so you have both things happening, right? They're starting at a different level, but also the relationship with trauma in these immune function measures is, is different across race groups as well. So I think it's both and. But the selection issue is one that is puzzling me of how, how do we actually get our heads around that. And we will uh, let Helen Meyer have the last question. Thank you. Um, so I guess my question is, um, since trauma over the life course is correlated, um, and you're looking at early life trauma, but you do have measures of midlife trauma, but we know that trauma over the life course is correlated. So um, how do you know that these associations with um, these immune markers aren't just driven by more recent experiences of different types of trauma um, that just so happen to be correlated with early life uh, trauma as well, just because we know how uh, life course processes work? Yeah, it's a great question, Helen. I, I would say we were really trying to dive deep on early life trauma specifically. Um, and we did not do a life course mediation analysis in this first pass at this. So I think future work could look at, is it driven through you know, the exposure to differential amounts of trauma throughout the life course? I, I, I think a little bit of our, you know, our, our pass at kind of a cursory mediation analysis with other adult SES, adult health behaviors, adult health conditions, would indicate that there is some kind of sustained impact of, of early life trauma here. But I think future work should really do the mediation analysis to look at that. I just, I think those are two separate stories. One focused on early life trauma specifically and how that's its relationship to immune function. And then what are the pathways through which that's operating? Okay, well, I think we'll wrap up there. I want to thank Dr. Novert again for a really fantastic presentation that obviously generated a lot of really good discussion and to thank all of you for your lively engagement. So at this point, uh, we'll wrap up the full part of the presentation. I'll invite our trainees to stay on for a professional development conversation with Dr. Novert um, and thank everybody else for attending and hope to see you at our next event on February 21st. Okay, looks like we have a good group staying on. So um, typically, we, I we give everybody a moment to introduce themselves and then just um, pose some questions to you. So I would like to sort of step back and let this be un unmediated by the moderator, um, if that's okay with you. So Grace, would you be okay with the leading off, um, you know, asking people to introduce themselves and maybe you can just go popcorn style from there? Yeah, if you could just tell me um, kind of your, you know, are you a pre-doc trainee or postdoc? What's your area of research um, in your department? That would be, you know, gives me a sense of who's in the room. 
I'll, um, maybe I'll start. I'm looking at Bobby. I'll start with Bobby. Hi, thank you so much for the great presentation. It really generated a lot of interesting uh, ideas for me as well. So I'm currently a postdoc in the Population Studies Center. And prior to that, I was at Penn State and received my PhD in health policy and administration with a dual concentration in demography. So like you, I'm very oh. interested in population health sciences. Yeah. I'm looking at Sarah next on my Zoom screen, like Brady Bunch style here. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm, uh, thank you for sharing your K99 material. Nice to meet you, uh, like ago. unofficially yeah. on Zoom now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm currently a research investigator at the SRC and then a postdoc affiliate with PSC. And I, so I'm, t I'm technically a family demographer. Awesome. Yeah, well, it's nice to finally, we've exchanged yeah. more emails, so it's nice to put a face to <laughs> Thanks again else. for sharing your material. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Oh, okay. Mira, I, am I saying your name right? You're in the middle here for me? Yep. Hi, Grace. I'm Mira. Uh, I'm a pre-doc trainee. Uh, my home department is sociology. Uh, I study social and moral dimensions of medical technology and was really excited about your presentation. Awesome. Um, I guess you're doing the popcorning. Oh, yeah. Okay. Janet, you're next on my, on my screen here. Hi, I'm Janet. Um, I'm from the sociology department, second year student. 